Opinionated Facts is brought to you by The Right Way Home Care, where they are committed to providing high-quality, client-centered, and affordable home care. They also offer personal care, respite care, light housekeeping, medication reminder, and a personal care. If you need any more information on The Right Way Home Care, make sure you reach out to them at www.therightwayhomecare.org. Again, that is www.therightwayhomecare.org. Microphone check, microphone check. Hey, this is the world's most popular barbecue talk, barbershop talk, man, cave conversation. However you like it or dislike it, this is the heavyweight champion sports talk podcast. These are your hosts, your boys back in the building, B-Way, along with my partner in crime, uh, the red-headed assassin, man, the last member of the red-headed Indian tribe, the man that gets it popping in the old head community. Uh, what else we got for you? The Donald Trump of Sports Talk podcast. No, man, don't do that right to now. me no more, man. Don't do that to me no more. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Mr. Red himself is in the building. We also have S. Dot Rudolph in the building. We also have special guest Mr. Jerry Johnson in the building. What's going on, fellas? How's everybody's week? Good, week man. Can't complain. Um, <laughs> anybody protest this week? I was down there by proxy. They sent me down there to be a medic unit for the protest. Does that count? No, you were working. You were getting paid for it. <laughs> Yeah, but I was the guy that made sure a protester went down. He could keep protesting. Uh, I got him up in order. <laughs> nah, you part of the problem down there. Nah, they love me. You probably I down know. there. You probably down there pushing old people down. I gave him the fist, man. I couldn't need with him no. They didn't need it. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> nah, you wouldn't need with him anyway. Oh man. Uh... We also have we also have special guests with us. What is it? Thirteen year pro, uh, one of the few guys that that made the Hall of Fame in every uh, basketball league profession level he played at. Uh, superstar in, in 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 different parts of the country as well as home. Uh, but 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 he represents the 717 proudly, Mr. Jerry Johnson. What's going on, man? Thank you, man. Appreciate it, man. Thank you guys for uh, for having me on. Uh, I'm just chilling, man. You know, enjoying the time and just taking it day by day, man. Really taking it day by day. How? Yeah. Question. Sorry, Red. Go no, go ahead. No, I was I was going to ask how the transition been from from you know, playing 13 years to, to being retired now and having all this time on your hands. Are you retired, though? I ain't there hearing no announcement. Oh, man, yeah. I, I, ain't played, I ain't played in two years, man. But really? It's, it's been, um, it's been all right, man. It's just, you know, just trying to stay busy, keep myself busy. That's the, that's the hardest part is uh, finding things to do. But, um, you know, I have kids, so anytime you have kids, you're always going to have things to do. Could you go out right now in the court and give Samar 30? Samar? Yeah. Well, maybe. <laughs> Mars in shape, man. <laughs> what do you say? Samar's in shape. He's a firefighter, man. He's in good shape. I've seen some fat firefighters. Don't be modest now, Jerry. You know you still got the juice. <laughs> I can still buy you 30. <laughs> Not 30, maybe, maybe 20. You know, you know, I was a defender, Jerry. Maybe 22. <laughs> All right, well, three for three from the field and the rest free throws because you're going to foul. Nah, nah, <laughs> foul, man. nah, that's one thing some more do. He'll foul and he'll argue with you about the foul. Like, nah, <laughs> the ref, right? He would argue about it. Yeah, you're going to argue about every foul call. It don't matter where it comes from. That ain't a foul because, according to the playbook in the PIAA. I'm a referee. That's not a foul. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't a ref back then. I wasn't a ref. <laughs> <laughs> no, he definitely, that's definitely Samar's motto, though. You're going to argue every call. And now, and now, and now you, you're going to be a referee, and you were the guy to argue every call. No, nah, I never argued calls, man. Play ball. I was with you. <laughs> Hap said Jerry would give Samar 40 right now. <laughs> Hap, <laughs> Hap, yeah, Hap, Hap said some more don't give nobody no credit for nothing. Appreciate it, Hat. Appreciate it, Hat. <laughs> <laughs> no, Yo, but the only time I ever see some more tired, man, we were Penn Matter running, and Jerry, he was guarding you, Jerry. <laughs> and I ain't never seen some more that tired in my life. Like, you could some more go all day, but he was like, 
he just low key shrugged his shoulders. He was like, he's a tough guard. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. I ever guarded when you were still playing. Though. That was that was that was like five years ago. Funny though is I always thought Jerry was the toughest guard I ever had, but then uh, Sam, Sam was tough. He was a lefty though. You know him, Jerry? Sam. I think I, I think I know who you're talking about. What's it? He played at Penn Manor with us a couple times too. He's not from Lancaster, I don't think. From New York, left hand shooter. If you tell me that, I probably know. I, I got some time. I got to match faces and names, like the name with the face, man. I can't know. Um... Pat knows who he is. I know that. Yeah, yeah, have the fat play with him. So uh, you got a rare thing going, Jay, where, I mean, you got more of your life ahead of you as much as you have behind you, and you're retired. So, like, that transition from, you know, doing one thing your whole life, and now you have half your life to go, hopefully. And uh, how, how was that mentally? Was that tough? Yeah, it is, man. It's actually not easy. It's, um, you know, it's like figuring out what to – it's like starting your life all over again. You know what I'm saying? It's like trying to figure out – you know what you're gonna do. You know what's gonna what's gonna keep you motivated. Uh, and it's just one of those things where you actually have to just go through it to understand it. You know what I mean? Uh, I mean, just like any, just like I guess, it's like kind of feeling like any job you do for such a long time. Um, but you know, at you know, 30. Well, when I was done, 36. You know, what I mean, it's a little bit different than being 56 or 66. You know what I'm saying? Um, but it's, it's, it's tough, man. It's tough. But like I said, it's just the most important thing is staying busy and, um, you know, finding things that you like to do that's, you know, that, that make you happy and make you feel good. Were you preparing for it ahead of time? I know you're close with Chris, and I went up to uh, see Chris a couple of times when he was playing, and I remember how he was, like, doing things in the all season, going to school, working towards something. So when he was ready to retire, he was ready. Did you do something like, along those lines? Um, not, I mean – not, not really in that, in that way. I was, you know, I was just, I don't know. I don't really know what to say. Just things just started happening for me. You know what I mean? It's not about preparing so much or what to do, but I was already doing things. You know what I mean? I wasn't, I wasn't doing things, a lot of things that was going to put actual, like, f money in my pocket, but I was already doing things to keep me busy. You know what I mean? I already had, like, my, my youth programs. Um, I was already doing training. You know, in the summer times, I was always doing things with youth anyway. So I figured, you know, once I was done, and my kids are still young, um, they're going to, I was going to be doing something that had to do with, with kids, you know what I mean? And um, I was already doing that for so long. Um, so once I got done, things just started kind of just falling in my lap. But to answer your question, no, nah, not really. Okay. How, like, like, how was that? Like being, you know, playing playing 13 years in uh, Europe, like how hard was it to, to leave your family, go, go play basketball for the season and had to come back and – you know, just making that transition and, and just, just, just just to not be able to be around your family every day. Well, I mean, when, you, when you've done one thing your whole life, you know, I've been playing ball since I was like nine, you know what I'm saying? You know, it's kind of just, you kind of go with the flow, you know, and then, but when you're doing things that, that make sense and things that are relevant um, and, and you know why you're doing them, you don't look at it in the way as a burden, you know what I mean? Or you're leaving your family. You look at it in the way, like, I'm supporting my family. I'm, I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing things for them. You know what I mean? So you don't, that stuff gets blocked out, you know what I mean? Because it's all about your why and why you're doing it. So when your why makes sense, everything else doesn't really matter. Definitely. Do you feel like you had to have, like, family support? Like, Bianca had to be there for the work with raising the kids? Was that a... Um, well, I mean, I was, me and Bianca, we've been together. So it was just kind of what we were already, you know what I mean? So it wasn't something that – it's kind of like a thing where – you know, we didn't put a, a, a label on our job and what we're doing as parents, you know what I mean? It's just things that already happened. It's already happening, you know what I mean? So it's like, oh, this is what we're doing. And no one's really thinking about that. You know, we're just living our lives and and taking care of the kids. And I'm playing basketball and she's, you know, doing her thing and being supportive in that way. So it is kind of things that's kind of gelled together. I mean, it, takes, it definitely takes a team aspect. Uh, just to be able to be successful that long, I could imagine it had to be, you know what I mean? You guys had to be on, on, a, on a united front for the, yeah, for the most part. I, I think being distant, you know, that, that stuff helps. Every, everybody needs a break, no matter what, you, what you're doing or, or, or how much you, you're passionate about a person or how much you like somebody. You know, it's the gaps to, to keep you missing each other is important. You know what I mean? I think that that also plays a, a big part um, in understanding too. You know, when you understand who's who and what's what, and 
it makes things easier too. Because a lot of times people, everybody want to step on each other's toes or this is what I need to do or this is what I need to do. But, you know, stay in your lane. You know, I mean, stay in your lane, I stay in my lane. And, you know, we, it, it works that way. When you, you, when you were coming up, when you were young, did you ever envision having the kind of success that you've had in your pro career? Not even just your pro career, but even college, high school. Um, I didn't really, I couldn't really think that far. I just know I was going to, I wanted to do something. You know what I mean? I know I wanted to play. Um, I worked hard at it. And, you know, I just stayed loyal to, to what, meant, what things meant to me and what I wanted. And I just stayed consistent with that and, and, and treated things the way they needed to be and just kept it going, you know, and things just started happening, you know. So I think one thing that I think a lot of kids don't do is, like, they, they're not consistent in what they want to do. You know, they have this idea in their mind that they want to do this, but it's like, well, how are you going to do it? And then as soon as things don't work as fast as they want them to, they drop off or they try to do something else. But this, this sticking and being consistent, just, I think that's one of the most powerful things you can do is just being focused and staying consistent. No, I agree with that. I always tell kids whenever I talk to them that nothing worth anything comes easy. It's going to be hard. If it's easy, anybody would do it. So, I mean, your example of that. Right. Um, I mean, it's hard to ignore what's, go uh, ignore what's going on with, this whole, with the Black Lives Movement matter with George Floyd. And I know you've been a literally a world traveler. You've uh, played in Turkey, Poland, France, Greece. Spent a good portion of your career in Astana and what is it, Kazakhstan? Am I saying it correct? Kazakhstan, yep. Yeah, which is uh, for people who don't know, it's like south of Russia, north of Afghanistan. It's like landlocked. So uh, it should be part of Russia during the Soviet or, or Russia, Russia state, but it broke off and now it's uh, actually Central Asia now. Um, so, but it's still you know part of. Old Russian state. So, being in other parts of the uh, of the world, all these different areas, how were the race issues in those? Was it an issue in those other countries? Um, I think I think race race is an issue everywhere. Um, just just the matter how it's embraced. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, I think in other countries, especially when you're black and you're in those part of the world, people are already looking at you in a certain way. But it's more of a way of kind of embracing you because you don't see people of color around as much mm -hmm. so i think that it's it's a little bit different than those countries but then you know they they see the things they see what's going on in the united states and then they they think that that's the way it is or that's the way things should be treated and that's kind of where i think they get their their their, their mindset from in some sense not all but just some of the, some of the experiences i've had in my opinion has kind of been like that um, any of the countries where you in, was there a black population in any of those countries? Uh, not really. Not really. I mean, you, you'll see some, you know, maybe, Af you know, Africans from Africa that are uh, there for, for business. And um, uh, African-Americans who are playing sports, you'll see. But there's not really a big, big culture of that. I mean, France does have it. The French, you know, there's a lot of Africans um, and, and, and in France and people of color. But um, where I was at, it was kind of like, if you seen a black person, you knew they were either there for business or, or for some kind of sports. How did they embrace you? Oh, it was cool. You know, you see, you know, you see a person of color, say, hey, what's up, man? How you doing? It's kind of like, oh, why are you here type thing? You know what I mean? But it was always like a welcoming thing. You know what I mean? It was always a reason to go up and ask somebody where you're from or, you know, what you're doing here. Well, they must have liked you. They made you a citizen in 2013 in Estonia. You're naturalized now, right? I mean, it was, yeah. <laughs> I was naturalized, I think, in 2000 and, I want to say 12, I think it was, 2012, 2013. But um, yeah, it was cool. You know, it was all about timing, situation. Um, so it kind of worked out. Was that mainly a thing to get you on the national team, or did you just really, like, like love the country and wanted to be? No, uh, actually, they, they offered it to me. Um, okay. because, you know, the team, the team was new and, um, you know, they had a national team already and they needed a point guard. So, you know, they brought me on and offered it to me, but it kind of worked out because our team was new and it was kind of like the first international team to, to start up in Kazakhstan to play in like the Russian league and travel all around Europe and things like that. So it kind of ended up 
helping out because it actually made it actually allowed our team to have an extra foreign player because I counted as as a citizen. Oh, that's nice. Do you see okay. yourself going back there to visit or anything along those lines? Oh, yeah, man, actually, I'll go back to visit. I have a lot of friends there, a lot of good connections there. Um, you know, so it's, you know, it's always, it'll always be a, a place of home. You know, I'm mean, not friends text me all the time, and stuff like that. So it's cool. What do you ever consider? Go ahead, Brian. Would you ever consider taking a job over Kazakhstan? When it comes to basketball, I mean. Yes, yes absolutely. I, I don't. I don't say no, uh, but I at least want to be able to see what my kids are going to be and, and what their, their future is going to be before, you know, taking some taking an opportunity like that if it ever existed or if it ever was an opportunity. Because, you know, again, if I left, it would, it would be cheating them. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'll be going again and won't be able to watch them grow and, and be there for them to see, you know, what, they're, what, what, what they want to do in their future. And, and, you know, just being there with them, I think it's important to have a father around making sure that they're making sound decisions and whatever help they need. You mentioned a few years back about uh, doing an exchange program with kids over from Kazakhstan and bringing them to Lancaster. Are you still, is that still something you're trying to do? We did it twice. I think we did it two or three times. We, we did it a couple of times. We had, we brought, I think it was like six to eight kids over. and They were here and, you know, we put them in housing. And my, one of my, my manager, which is a good friend of mine, Nico, Nikolai and, and, and Joma, they brought kids over and stuff. So it was fun. It was good for them. It was good. Go ahead, B. Uh, so just being over there, did, how many championships did did you win in? Because uh, I, I can't Kazakhstan. say it. Yeah. I don't think we had like – How do you say had, it? Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan. I think we had like four. I think it was four and like maybe two or three cups. It's somewhere around there. I don't remember off top. But. Hey, what's the difference between the titles and the cups? I mean, we were trying to figure it out. Free show. So the titles is, uh, you know, your it'll be just your league. You know, what I mean, your 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 league. So say if you have ten teams in your league, and then the cup will, the cup will be, you know, because in in Europe, man, you have uh, a it's kind of like the LLE. You got section one, two, and three. So we'll put it in the context of that. So section one title would be just uh, McCaskey or, or Township, Solanco. But then the league will be section one, two, and three in all the teams. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 So, you know, so you have your Kazakhstan league and then you have your cup. So that makes sense. So the cup is kind of a thing you want to – it's like the Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Why well, do you, you think it's, it's, it's hard to find uh, – well, for teams – and or with, well for players in Europe to get multi-year deals with one team because you always hear about players going over but they always go to different teams when they go over so yeah. is it hard for them to sign like a multi-year deal with one team it's not it just it, it just depends on uh, Europe is kind of weird you gotta actually have to be like in the business to kind of understand it you know what I mean um but you gotta understand like it's you can go from make a peanuts to six figures, you know what I mean? So it's kind of like your situation. If you're with a mid or low low league and you're just starting, you don't want to you don't want to sign a multi-year deal with the team that's you're just getting startup kind of yeah. salary. You blow up and play good, you can go from night you can go from you know, night to day, you know, day to night whatever in salary and in situation. You know what I mean? So you never want to kind of Lock yourself in. Lock yourself in, you know what I mean? But, you know, but there are, once you get to that plateau of you're at the top, you know, a lot of guys sign multi-year deals, three, four-year deals. Yeah, um, you know, and, 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 you know, Europe is really not, until you really get, until you really break that boundary, you know, it's, it can be, it's unstable sometimes. You know what I mean, so it's, it's a fight, man. It's definitely a fight. It's definitely a lot of um, different things that play out, you know, situation, team situation. You know, making sure you're staying healthy, um, agent, team, country, word of mouth. This is a, it's like it's like getting drafted in the NBA. You know, I mean, it's like there's a lot of things that got to work to to be successful, and that's when that consistency comes in. Consistency and 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 not letting up and keeping staying focused, because you know it might take you four or five years to break that barrier, or some guys never. They just find themselves just floating for. How many years, you know, they can upstand. Overall. Can you take to another 
higher leagues over there. Was it Lithuania or you were yes. in Europe? I mean, so I played in I played in Euro League. So that Euro League is kind of like the NBA of Europe. So I played in that. I played in the Euro Cup. I played in. I pretty much played in like every league, possibly just through certain teams. You know what I mean? Is that overall the best league out there, the Euro League? Euro League, yeah. Euro League is a, a combination of the best. So when you see NBA Europe and then playing those those big time teams, those are Euro League teams. So those are like the, and they're from they're different countries scattered around. You know what I mean? The top teams and each country so or top two teams in each country so it's kind of made up in a, like a union you played against some guys like uh i know sean may played over there from carolina darren williams ty lawson you played against any of those guys I, I played against darren williams when he was in turkey um i think during that i think it was a lockout period i played against ty lawson he was in zalgiris we actually beat them that was actually our first game ever really? when once the team Astana started in Kazakhstan. That was their first game at home. We, we beat them. That was during the lockout. They had Sonny, Sonny Williams, too. He was the NBA guy. Mm -hmm. so. so when you were going up against these guys like Ty Lawson, Darren Williams, was it like a measuring stick for you to see if you could play at that level? How'd you take that? How'd you approach those games? Well, I mean, I approached it like any other game. Uh, you know, those guys were good. Uh, but, you know, there's also a lot of guys in Europe, too, that can play in the game but just don't get a chance. And, you know, vice versa. There's a lot of guys that don't belong in the NBA or in the NBA. So it's, you know, it's a crapshoot, man. It's, but those guys are good, man. Those guys are good. And it's just about timing and situation. Um, you know, it's politics. But those guys are good. Those guys can play. So coming from uh, this Lancaster in general, do you think that was a plus for you? Did that add a chip on your shoulder? Or do, or, or, or do you think it just hurt you because people look down at, you know, you, you were coming from a small city or whatever? I mean, it has to be a combination of things, you know what I'm saying? It's just not one thing. It's just about also, like, what, what you're trying to do. You know, what do you want to do and how bad you want it? And, you know, what sacrifices are you going to make? And, you know, are you willing to go to a lower-level school or, or a lower-level team and prove yourself and put yourself in situations and not take any kind of excuses to, oh, well, you know, I'm from Lancaster or I'm from here or there. You know what I mean? Because at, at the end of the day, basketball is one language. You can play or you can't. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I was always told, like, if, if you know, if you're, if you're good enough, they're going to find you. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, it's, you just can't have any excuses in the business. I mean, you just got to go out there and, 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 and do oh. what you do. Yeah, I remember coming from uh, – hold on, hold on, Red. Uh, no, because I remember coming up, like – I was, you know, I, I came up, you know, looking up to my brother and like that era with Mikhail and them guys, and uh, like we didn't we didn't really look to the next level of, of much, you know. What I mean, we played high school football there or, or, or whatever, and then we we didn't really look to, to college. But like seeing guys like you and 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 being around you and 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 just seeing your work ethic on a daily basis, like it, it inspired us younger guys to like, man, this thing can really you, you got a shot to really make this thing beyond beyond high school. So, I mean, that was, that was a testament to your hard work and, and, and how hard you grind it to, to make it, to make it up out of, out, out of Lancaster and, 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 and be able to travel the world and, you know what I mean, go to eight, nine, 10 different countries or whatever you did. So that was just a big deal, you know, just coming up from my angle, being younger and, and uh, seeing guys like you and Chris, you know what I mean, come up and just make it out. But uh, go ahead, Red, with your next question. Well, I was going to take it back to the McCaskey days. I mean, we didn't ask no questions about high school, really. Yeah, that was my next one. <laughs> and I didn't really get a chance to, like, you guys are a little older than me, so I, I didn't really get a chance to see him on a daily basis. Um, I remember the first time I actually got to go watch him, I think I was seventh, seventh or eighth grade. Um, number one, i never seen a light greener than Jerry's. I mean, <laughs> for, I remember the first time watching him, this guy was pulling up and freaking damn near half court. <laughs> I'm thinking, <laughs> hey, like, why nobody else torn up from there? Because Jerry like was green, so he could do <laughs> kind of do what he wanted. My my question was, as far as high school goes, high school level, who was the pride? Who was the most talented player you ever played against? It could be from anywhere. Uh, Jameer Nelson. Jameer Nelson. In high school, yeah, he was good. You played him at what a camp? Nah, Chester. He played Chester. Play Chester. Oh, that's yeah. right. He did play at Chester. I forgot about that. And um, I think he probably was one of the probably better, better players overall, for sure. Who was? Jameer Nelson. Who you say after that? No, nah, I, I said I, I, he was probably the one. He was probably the better. 
with the, the, reason, the reason I'm asking that question, because I watched the interview like last question. week with uh Tootie Tootie Allen, John Tootie Allen, Coastville. And he mentioned you in the in the interview. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, that's my man Tootie. My yeah, man. that's what he's saying. He said, Man, Jerry, that's still my that's still my guy. I'm I'm thinking, you know, from position wise, you know what I'm saying? Position wise for me. Um, but Tootie was man, Tootie was an amazing player, man. Um he was he was he was he was a he was a great player. Um, he told the story how you guys went down there, gave them their first loss, first and only loss that year. Yeah, but a lot of people don't know that me and, me and Tootie go way back, though, from, like, maybe, like, 13, 14, like, even before. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, when he, when those guys, um, it was him and um, uh, the little point guard, Reese, and uh, Dewan Wagner, those guys playing for Del Val. That was when um, I think Dewan Wagner was probably, like, the best f- freshman in the country or something like that. And they was coming up to Steven Trey before the new Steven Trey, obviously. Um, so I knew John for a long, long, long time, man. And, uh, and, you know, John was definitely, definitely, you know, for sure one of the better players too. Um, but like I said, Jamil Nelson was a guard, he was a point guard. So that's what, yeah. when you asked me that, it right. was, that initial thing is like head to head, like that was probably one of the better players. I, mean, I was just asking just because I, me- I remember hearing the interview and he just, he had spoke about you and rumor has it he's walking around with your state title. <laughs> I mean, they won, man. I mean, that uh, they deserved it. There ain't really much you can say. He said he'd be willing to get a. He said he'd be willing for you to get that same five. He get his same five. He said he knows you guys are out of shape, but he would still be willing to go ahead and do it. Uh not. <laughs> I think I'm probably still in shape, man. He said that in the interview. He said he still be willing to go ahead and do it. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, uh. Watching that interview actually brought back a lot of memories. Uh, full disclosure, me and B-Way played JV your last year, that 2000, 2001 season. And uh, I remember being down there at Coatesville and then uh, – Play varsity, though. I should have played varsity. Just just throwing that out there. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so um, do you feel like – like, what, what are your thoughts on that 2000, 2001 season? It's kind of known as the golden era of McCaskey basketball in a way. Yeah. Do, um, do you feel like – I mean, you were the only team to beat that Coastville team that year. They were 33 and one, I think, 32 and one. 33 and one. And uh, you guys would have played them after the Williamsport game, I think, but we ended up losing. Any thoughts on that season? Do you think you uh, you guys could have beat them again in the rematch? I think, um, well, I mean, I, I, of course, I mean, I, I feel like we could beat them, but I mean, it's almost not even like wishful thinking, you know. I I don't know. I I just I don't I don't really live like that or. It's, I mean, it's good to, to kind of say that could we have beat them, but it's kind of like wishful thinking. I mean, we beat them once. But um, I just think that even bigger than that game, I always look at, like, the mistakes. Like, now I look at myself because I, I do reflect about th- that season. And um, the one thing that sticks out to me is just, like, and this is, this is, this is no knock on, 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 on coach or anything. I just looking at it because I, I played so much basketball. And I understand the game very, like, very well now because I've played all over the world. And um, looking back at that, just like our team was, everybody was so focused on that that fight we had. But I think there was some mismanagement with the team we had because with the players we had. Like you know, we had Naquan, we had John, we had um, Cam Winnington and Brandon. Like we that five we had wasn't the, the bench players we had. When we were blowing teams out by 20 and 30, 40 points, man, those guys should have been playing in the game. You know what I mean? Everybody was just so fascinated on that five and keeping people entertained that that's what caught up to us. Even that Chambersburg game when we lost and Naquan and those guys had to play, but they wasn't used to playing. So those, no. guys, those guys didn't have the experience that they had. So when you, So when at the end of the season, when you see that, those guys had to play when we got in foul trouble, me, Dustin, and Perry. Those guys would now have to go and play in the biggest games of their life. And now it's just like, yo, how, what are they supposed to do? And everybody's like yelling and this and this and that, but you know, it wasn't their fault. Those guys should have been playing when we were beating teams. Should have been playing five minutes, 10 minutes. So now when they're in those situations or we get in foul trouble, those guys could, we could sit and rest for two, three minutes. And those guys could understand what, what they had to do in the game. So now when you look at a game like Williamsport when we lost, you know, I think it was just management. You know what I mean? Management and, and, and understanding that it wasn't just about those five. That five had a lot more to it. 
it's funny you say that because me and B Way had these conversations plenty of times where I felt just being up close and personal during those days that our second five on that your varsity team was the second best team in the LL. Like, oh, man, yeah, man, I mean, man, like, you know, yeah. Quan Talton, the Quan Lee, John Cameron, Johnny Rivera. Yeah, I, I, yeah. those guys, th those guys could play. Um, those guys were raw, but you know, even like the next years when those guys were playing, those guys were they were they could play. They, they, Dustin, those guys still, and Perry, those guys still were, had, had a good team even when I left. So you got to figure, you know, that's seven months removed from those guys. And they're playing now. Those guys are the, the main guys. So nah, I agree with you 100%. And uh, I remember being up there at Pottsville for that Williamsport game. And our whole starting five got in foul trouble. You got four, I think. And uh, you end up found out, right? Yeah, we ended up found out, man. And the thing about it was, man, we were kicking our ass, too. Like, those guys couldn't play with us, man. They, they couldn't play with us. That first half, it was like a crapshoot. Like, there was no way that that team could beat us. The only way they could beat us was what had happened. Yeah. I mean, only everybody, the whole starting five was in foul trouble. It's kind of a unusual thing. But I remember everybody saying that, you know, I've always said the bench would have got – there was games against, like, Salenko that year and some teams in the LL. We were, we were up 35, and you guys were still playing late in the fourth. Yeah. Or that next year, like the next year after you graduated, we went to the Final Four of the state. So, like, it's just showing and that was with them guys on the bench that played against you guys every day in practice, but also proved, proved that they could, you know what I mean, go out there and get buckets. And the thing about it, too, it was just like those guys watching us, they, were, they, they, knew, they knew how to play. They're watching us, you know what I mean? And, and it's not like we were – no, we played basketball, you know what I mean? We were in, in, this, in a system to where we had to do this, do that, do that. Now, we went out there, we played, we made things happen. You know what I mean? I think, me, I was, before I got to McCassie's, I was already polished. I was a polished player because I've, I've played at the boys club and, and Arnell and those guys, man. And I was in the gym so much. Anthony Gibson, you know, uh, and Dustin, you know, Perry and those guys later. By the time we got to McCassie, man, we was, we were not taking credit for that. We were groomed, man. Like, it was one of those things where I remember when I talked to my the coach at Ryder, um, Coach Baggett, who's the head coach there, he was telling me, he was like, you know, basketball is, man, so overrated. Coaching is so overrated because everybody wants to get to the point to where they want the best players. You're just putting those players in position. Look at the Dukes and the Kentuckys. Those guys are so polished. I'm not saying that those coaches aren't coaching, but – you can't guard those guys. You can't guard them because they're that good. You know, two, three plays they're making, and those guys are just playing basketball. And that's kind of how we were at a lower level, but at McCaskey. You know what I mean? All you got to do is put us on the court, and we'll make things happen. The thing that stood out about that, that time when you were there was how big you guys were. Like, Gabe was like a 6'2 point guard in the LL. You had Perry, Everhart, Dustin, I mean, even Akeem. You guys were so big. And now you see a McCaskey lineup sometimes. They don't even have us. A, a big man over six foot as their big man. <laughs> no comment, yo. <laughs> different times, man. Different times. Do you see that? I like Freddie, the coach they have now there at McCaskey, but do you see that, that style of McCaskey coming back? That that level of basketball? Um, I don't know, man. I think – I don't know. I can't really say. I just think that Kids need to work. If they really want to play, they have to work. You know, they have to be fundamentally sound to understand the game. Um, and I think it's – it just depends on errors, man. It depends on who's doing what, what kids want to play, what kids are using the time that they're not playing video games and outside in the park or finding ways to make themselves better. better. Even with all this COVID lockdown stuff, what are you still doing? to find ways to make yourself better. And all that stuff plays in, you know, it makes your coach's job easier. Um, Cause the coach's job, a lot of times coaches, they're coaching during that, 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 that period. You know I mean? You're not gonna get better during that period. You know what I mean? As a team you can be, but fundamentally that stuff that you have to work on all the time. You know what I mean? I mean, you make a good point with just saying in general how, you know, what, what great coach don't have great players. And you could say that, you know what I mean, the coach is developing the players, but, I mean, at the end of the day, you need, you know, you need, you need guys. Yeah, you need and guys too. You need guys too. I mean, you need players too, but at the same time, though, 
if you got great players, you still got to have a great coach to be able to put those great players in positions to allow them to be great. You know what I mean? I see, I mean, I see players that are great, but then don't have coaches to put them in positions to be, to show that they're great. You know what I mean? You still swing the ball 50 times when you got a player right here that can create. Well, just touching on that, like you, like you, you saw, like we, we always talk about this, like how 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 you 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 saw youth development in Europe, as in to how it is here in America. Do you think that uh, like like Europe has a leg up with just how they develop uh, young basketball players? One hundred percent, one hundred percent. I mean, watching how things are, the systems are, and how and, and you know, like I said, every country is different, but watching how kids are training. Like, man, kids are training every day. Every day. I mean, with the exception of what's going on with the COVID, tell me a place right now where, in Lancaster, where kids can go and get real training every day. Well, that's, that's a tough one. <laughs> like, like Once a week, twice a week. They can go on your Zoom. They can go on Jerry Johnson's Zoom. But, I, but, I'm, but I'm being realistic, though. Tell me a place right now that's open where kids can go and get real training with, with people who, who know how to train every day. Oh, every is day. It, I mean, is find that an issue, Mr. Jerry, you think, or is, or is that a country issue? Do, are other cities doing that, like Europe, where they're training every day? I mean, I just saw that documentary at PG County, and they had some facilities down there where kids seem like they were getting work every day. I think that's a, uh, I think it's a, uh, I think it's a little like a, a society thing. I think it's a, a, a non-cultural thing to not having the culture, but I think it's a, I just think it's where we're at. I think it's our demographics. You know what I'm saying? I think people want to help people when they want to help people. You know what I mean? They don't want to put in a situation where, and I don't think that's just for basketball. I just think that's for all sports. You know what I mean? I think that there's not a place where in a city where kids can go and get to and don't have to spend an arm and a leg to get real, life things to help them you know what i mean but then what happens is people complain that at the high school level why their teams aren't good or why their basketball team's not good why their football team's not good well there's nowhere where the kids gonna be able to go every day and train and and, and get that information no you can't wait till the season and become a, and train it's too late it's a lifestyle it's a lifestyle you know what i mean and europe has always one had the upper hand because they have that you know what i mean they have that um that culture you know what I mean? It's, it's just, it's different. But I think in bigger cities, like obviously like New York, Philly, um, you know, out in LA, I think you can, you can find places like that. I mean, Lancaster County is small. You know, we want to be, we want to be like this, this, this big, our act is though we know, and, and people around want to help and do this. But realistically, when it's really time, like I could be in the gym every day, all day. I mean, shout out to Counter Bowman and the mix. I mean, she's been allowing me to, kind of transition into that. Um, and, I, and she knows I can, I can be in the gym all day. And, and she's always says, oh my God, Jerry, you just, you just, <laughs> I, can, I can live in the gym. You know what I mean? She's starting, she's allowing, I mean, I think, you know, off topic, she's a great person to be able to lead, lead the inner city um, in the mix. She's a great person for it. And she's been allowing me slowly to, to do that. Um, but, you know, we, it'll get there at some point. So everything you're saying sounds like I mean, you're 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 ready to be a head coach and implement some of these things you've seen in Europe and around around the world. Is that what you're going to bring to La Academia? You you have what's your ten year plan for that place? Well, it's crazy. Five, five year plan. I mean, I don't even know if it's a it's really a plan. It, I mean, like I said, it was it just happened. You know, what I mean, it wasn't something I was looking for. It kind of just fell in my lap. So, quick story. So, I was I was coming from Ocean City, and I. Uh, me and Keanu had just met right before I had, I had went to Ocean City and we were just talking about how, you know, how I can help her, how she can help me, how we can help the community, how we can help kids and things like that. And she called me on my way home and she was like, Jerry, um, we the school academia. Uh, you know, I know we just talked about gym space or whatever like that, but they need gym time. You know, would you be receptive enough to, you know, to share some of your time with them? And I'm like, nah, cool. I was like, you know, if, you know, they need gym time. They're trying to get their things together. That's fine. You know what I mean? Just as long as, we're, as long as we can we can make it work for both of us, it's cool. You know what I mean? And then she, uh, I think she called me back. 
I think it was like that Sunday I was, I was leaving. I was coming home Friday. She called me that Sunday and she was like, well, they need a coach. And I was like, a coach. <laughs> I was like, nah, I said, nah, I ain't, I, I ain't about that life, man. Cause I, I know how hard coaching is, you know what I'm saying? And, and that's not something I wanted to really jump myself into was coaching because I, I just know the demand of it. It's not, it's not something where you pick and choose when you want to do it. You know what I'm saying? Like that's, and I know myself, I know how I am. And she was like, well, you know, Tommy, the principal wants to talk to you anyways. I said, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to him. So I talked to Tommy, Tommy, oh, Jerry, I heard so much about you. And, you know, it was kind of one of those things. I look back, I was like, the job was already mine before I even decided to take it. <laughs> <laughs> they already knew who they wanted. So I was already, I already had the job and not even, that's not even what I was really wanting to do. And, and Tommy just pulled me in. She was like, Jerry, you know, you know, we want to bring you in high school basketball. And I was just like, well, like, how serious do you want to be? I'm like, do you want to be like rec ball or do you trying to be like PIAA or something? You no, know, PIAA, we're really serious. I said, okay, well, if you're really trying to be PIAA and not rec, then I, I, might, I might consider just give me a couple of days. So then it went from just like, Jerry, uh, how about coaching? We'd just be a flat out coach. You know, we'll, we'll give you a salary for coaching and you can do it. And I was just like, okay, well, I don't consider that. So then I, so we had, we met, we met twice. So when I told him I'll, I'll do it, I was like, all right, I'll, I'll do it. Then he's like, well, how about being full-time? What do you mean full-time? Like, in the school, I was like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm not looking for no full-time. <laughs> I just went down there. I just finished playing. I'm trying to figure myself out. He was like, look, we'll make you AD. Um, you know, we'll give you benefits. We'll do this. We'll do that. And I'm just like, ah. I thought about it. And then, you know, my cousin Mark Simmons is a principal, and I'm talking to him. And like, look, man, you know, Give it a shot. Ended up doing it. You know, it was, you know, come to find out, you know, Kiana, Ted Darkest, and all those people with the community was already, like, they were already advocating for me as taking the job, and I didn't even know it. Yeah. <laughs> One hey, thing is, I got something I want you to follow up on, because I know you were playing a couple of games at, at Thaddeus Stevens. Mm -hmm. and what, like, there's some kind of issue with your, what, what's the issue there? I don't. I kind of should have did my research on it because I'm not I'm not even sure myself. That's why I'm asking. What was the oh. issue where you guys had to play at Stevens? Even though I mean, it's a great facility for you guys, I'm just wondering why you had to play there. Oh well, oh well, because so there's a lot of moving parts, man. So I ended up I ended up taking a job, and you know, I, kids came over, and we had to play at Stevens because we don't have a gym. You know, what I mean, we don't have we don't have a gym. We're PIAA now, but we don't have a gym. So you know, hopefully. Dilks this upcoming year that we're PIAA will, you know, we can work out something to play some games there. Yeah. Um, most of our games are on the road. Did you have a lot of issues getting into PIAA? Um, not really. Actually, it was easier than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Yeah, it was easier than I thought it was going to be. So, uh, being there now, I mean, you have one of, you know, the top freshmen around uh, with a uh, – Dustin Salisbury's son, mm -hmm. uh, Demise. What's how good do you think he he can be? I mean, he's a Division One player, man. He, he's he's uh he's for sure a Division One player. Yeah. I mean, I already see that already. You know, it's just it's just going to be a matter of what level of Division One. Is it going to be mid major, or is it going to be you know um, at a big time school? And a lot of that, a lot of that, you know, depends on height. It depends on Abilities, but you no know, talent-wise, for sure, he he he's going to be a college scholarship player for sure. That's, that's no doubt in my mind. You know, as long as he stays healthy and everything, he's and he's and most importantly, he's a, he's a good kid. He's he's a really good kid. So, on that same note, so you played at the Metro Atlantic Athletic Conference uh, at Ryder. Do you feel like you could have went to a bigger school? Do you wish you did? Or are you? Feel like you were at the place you're supposed to be. Uh, I don't regret nothing, man. I think I was I was where I needed to be at. Mm -hmm. I was right where I needed to be, right there. I played my first year. I started um, rookie of the year. Uh, I couldn't actually be in a better place. You know what I mean? It's it was good to me. You know what I mean? It was good to me, and I don't regret anything about being at Ryder. You know, education wise, basketball wise, it was the best only decision I had. <laughs> <laughs> No, it definitely worked out for you. I mean, you, you're in the Hall of Fame as of 2013. You're a Ryder Hall of Famer, one of the all-time leading scorers up there, one of the all-time leaders in assists. 
I was just curious as a competitor, because I know how competitive you are. Have you ever thought about how you would have uh, performed in a, you know, ACC, a Big Ten, or, you know, A-10 type conference? Well, I mean, who, who knows? Maybe I wouldn't even have played my first year. Maybe I wouldn't have played until my junior year or senior year. Mm -hmm. I, I, you, don't, you don't know that. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a lot of, like, uncertainty. I, I really can't answer the question. But if, could I play at that level? Of course. But on what level? You know what I mean? Could, would I have been at a, a five, ten-minute player or or I could have been a 30-minute player? You know what I mean? You don't, you don't know. You know what I mean? Just like people didn't know what I was going to do at Ryder. I mean, like my, my, my coach, my coach who's 80 now, Don Harm, he'll tell you now. When Jerry came here, I didn't know what he was going to be. He was just a piece of, he was just a piece of the pot. You know what I mean? But my mindset was like, yo, I'm coming in here to make I'm coming here to make some, some I'm coming here to make some shit happen. You know what I'm saying? That was my mindset. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't coming there just to, to for a trip, hour and a half ride to to, to Lawrenceville. <laughs> I read an interview from your coach on your transition from a uh, freshman to sophomore season when he moved you to shooting guard. And how tough that was for you? Was that a? You remember that being a real tough experience? Um, it was hard. It wasn't really that I made a transition to shooting guard. It was just that I was taking a lot of shots. <laughs> <laughs> like, the I, ever saw. <laughs> I, was, I was still the point guard, but it was different because you got to stand at the division one level, man. Like you can have a surprise, but now that second, third time you're playing the team, or that next year. Now people know who you are. Like they, they scouting you. Yeah. You're a rookie of the year in the conference. Yeah, but you gotta understand, we had a player of the year too, and then they were, yeah. we were all, they were all seniors. So me just running around as a five eleven freshman, <laughs> I could do what I want to do because nobody knew like who this little dude was. Yeah. But my second year it was like okay, you know they call it the sophomore slump. Yeah. It wasn't really a sophomore slump. I still scored a lot of points, but my team didn't win. <laughs> we didn't wasn't winning nothing. You know what I'm saying? Because I had to learn how to play again. Like I had to learn how to run the team. I was playing like I was at McCaskey my my second year. I was just shooting a bunch of shots and scoring and and that was what it was. But then I had to learn how to lead my team. You know what I mean? Because even at McCaskey, I was 5'11, six foot. I wasn't really taught how to be a point guard. And that's the difference between me being a mid-major and being a, you know, a, at a high level division one is because what high, what, what high level division one is bringing a 5'10 guard and is shooting a bunch of three pointers? They're gonna bring, they bring you in as a point guard. I wasn't, I wasn't taught how to, I wasn't really taught during that time how to run a team as a point guard. I was out there just scoring. Mm -hmm. So that transition, my sophomore year at Ryder, I had to watch film, understand coaches in my ear. I had to learn how to be a point guard and how to run a team. But I still did. I was still able to do that, and be individually successful, and be successful as leading my team and winning some, you know, winning some league titles and stuff like that. When did you start feeling that way? You're, the way you're speaking now, like knowing you had to adjust as a player. When did you realize that? By a junior, your sophomore season, like when did you get that knowledge? You know, I gotta get better at this. I can't do this. Just you know, just watching film and experience, learning. But trying to learn quick, because you only got four years, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. trying to learn, trying to be the best you can do all at once, you know what I mean? Because you, you don't, you only have a certain, you don't, there's a timeline on it. You only got four years, you know what I'm saying? So it was like, you know, and, and when I was at Ryder, I came home. I never really came home. I came home Fridays, Saturdays, that was it. Mondays through Friday, Mondays through Thursdays, I was, and a lot of times Monday through Friday, I was training. I was taking summer, summer classes. Um, also, too, because coming into Ryder, you know, I was high risk academically. So I had to change my mindset of like, you know, I have a great opportunity here. I'm getting a, I'm getting over a $200,000 education. I cannot, you know, take advantage of that. You know what I'm saying? So I made sure I was ahead and doing what I needed to do in the classroom. So I stayed all summer, all year round. So my senior year, I only had like two classes, a Wednesday night class and a Tuesday, Thursday class. My senior year was cakes. You know what I mean? Nah, I feel like you're ahead of your time. I don't know if you're getting good advice from other people because, I mean, Brand B. Way has athletes all the time. And I, I get to know them through him. And um, I always say the kids need to stay. If they come home, they get in trouble, or they, they, they lose focus. They should just stay up the, on campus. But, 
But I think one, I think a lot, a lot of kids don't do this. They, they don't, they don't. And you know, I don't want to say this to 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 make it sound not right, but you gotta learn from what other people ain't from other people's mistakes, man. If you see this dude, if you see this guy, and that's what I understand, like kids these days, like you, you see these dudes getting arrested, doing this, doing that, and it's not right. Why are you going to continue to do that? Why? It does, it's, logically, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. So from my side, I'm watching guys, other guys, in another way, watching film or watching other guys ahead of me. And once you get into that, that point of actually being at the university, you, see, you have other people there who are ahead of you. So now you see, you see what you need to do. You know what I mean? It's there. Once you're, if you're there on a scholarship, man, you, you have so much, you got so many resources and people, alumni helping you and, and showing you the ropes. Like, you got to be an idiot to not finish. You got to be an idiot. I agree. No, I'm, I mean, going to college. Leaders, Jerry. Huh? A lot more followers and leaders. Yeah, I know that, but it's like you're watching people. You just watch. All you got to do, you don't even have to say anything. Just look at people. Yeah. <laughs> not say nothing. Watch people how they move, watch how they talk, watch how they act. Look at the results they get because of that. It's simple, man, but I don't know, man. It's, it's simple to us. You know what I mean? It's simple to us. But it's our job to, to be around that so kids can see that more often. You know what I mean? I think that's yeah. one of the things we're like, we're kind of missing, man. We have so much, so many resources. You know, we got Chris Wilson, we got Perry Patterson, we got Dustin Salisbury, we got, um, you know, so many female leaders as well that are so successful, man, but there's an issue in Lancaster where we push those people away somehow or we don't welcome those people back. And that's a big, that's a problem. You know what I mean? And then you get to all this stuff going on and then you don't see those people that are successful help protesting in Lancaster doing this, doing that. You know, they protest on their own way, but you don't have these people back here in Lancaster helping because Lancaster has this feeling where it's not so welcoming sometimes. I feel it all the time, but you know, I'm. <laughs> I grew up on a 300 block of South End, so for me, my, my mindset is like, yo, I've been through this before, you know what I mean? So I, that's not gonna, I'll keep knocking on doors till somebody opens, you know what I'm saying? No, that's big. I mean, you, first of all, but just going to college, I think really changed my mindset about a lot of things. That freshman year, when, you're, when, when you see the seniors who are doing, you know what I mean, doing their thing or working hard, and you see like, just the way they talk is different and, yeah. and, and their, their respect level. You're like, man, like you gotta, I gotta change some things up. Like you think going in that that you know some things, but then there's so much more that 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 you just didn't know. Right. right. And like further, like to your comment, I teach in York now, and I swear we have, you know, what I mean, first of all, there's a lot of Lancaster folks and Cassie grads that teach in York with me. And, and that's for me, that's a problem. Not because y'all, but that's for me. That's a that's a, my opinion. That's a problem. Yeah. That's yeah. a problem because again, like I, like I said, you have so many people who are successful in their own way. Whether it's education, whether it's business, whether it's uh, sports, and I just feel Lancaster itself in an inner city where a lot of help is needed, we push our successful people out everywhere but being here. And then people are upset about, oh, well, why this ain't this? Why this person ain't doing this? Because you're pushing them, you're pushing them well. I remember somebody saying something to me, I ain't gonna say who said it, but. They were just like, and like I said, I mean, I have a lot of good business friends and stuff like that. And I'm not saying this to, to be um, objective or trying to stir the pot or anything. I'm just telling you what, what, how I feel as a person of having some success and being here and seeing people like you in York and, and Danielle and Key Wong. Like, it's crazy. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's crazy to me. But it's like people were saying like, oh, well, why just, you know, there's not a lot of black people of color downtown protesting and people that are leaders and stuff like that. But you got to understand something too, man. Sometimes going downtown is not the most welcoming place for for people either. You got bars, you got you got some bars and stuff that don't want people down there that look like me and you or or people that you may not know. So you can't be mad at them for not wanting to go down and protest. Well, I can't. I don't go down there now. I don't feel like it's good. So why do I go down there in disarray? <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Okay. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> No, I'm just like saying, like with like down in York, we see like I, I work with a lot of folks who are York High grads, and they come back to teach at York High, and like it'll be, it seems as though Lancaster treats Lancaster grads as like it's not good enough or something. They want to go out somewhere else and get somebody else. 
So that's why it's just it's just frustrating at that level. That's the problem. I mean, that's you know, it's one of those things where like you could be a person, like I me, mean, I could be a person to sit back and watch and just and complain. It's easy to do. You know what I mean? But it's another reason why I I, I took the challenge and, and going to Locker Davis. Just try to be in the mix and, and try to help kids and, and be a personal voice and people where the kids can see walking around and be like, yo, man, this guy, this, if I can do it, you can do it type thing. You know what I'm saying? So I think it's important, man. You know, I grew up on the 300 block of South End. And now I'm on the north side of South End. You know what I mean? So <laughs> for me, yeah. you know, it's, it's a lot more to do with the youth and they need to see that. They need to see people who are, who are successful, that are real, that you can touch, you can talk to, you can go out to lunch, that are real people. And I think the more you see that, the more things will change and the more um, successful kids and things will be better again. In, in, in. It sounds yeah, like... You're 100% right, Jerry. Uh, even going to schools and doing like career days and stuff, and I'll be with a crew and you just see how certain kids look at you differently when they know, like, hey, I went to Reynolds, I went to McCaskey, I went to Putin. And they're like, oh, you're a firefighter? I could be a firefighter? And you've yeah. got the other guys I work with, that, you know, they just don't gravitate them the same way sometimes. They, yeah. These kids want somebody to look up to that came from where they came from. For sure. I mean, that's, that's what it is. You know I mean? That's, you know, it's, 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 no, it's no knock or no shade on people from outside coming in. You know, it's always good to build relationships other people because those people have resources too. But this is people that are successful that are still living here. It's important that you gotta give them them jobs, man. Like you can't go out finding somebody here, find, bringing somebody here, coaching over here, and then find out that they shouldn't, they're not even qualified or they got, they got, they got, they got, they got bad things on their record that somehow slip through the cracks and they're able to be here, like that doesn't make sense, man. You got, you got, you got these same people. Even for example, look at look at look at Damian Henry and those guys down in Coachville, Coach Ortega and those guys. Man, look what they look at look at look what they did for the track team. Look what they did for their football team. How you? That they, went down there. they went down there and killed it. This doesn't make sense. Absolutely killed it. It, it don't. It doesn't make sense to me. Um, same thing with B-Way. We got B-Way at Catholic in Europe. Well, we should be here. Well, well, that's what I'm saying. It's just, I don't know, man. It's. I, I'm just one person. I try to do what I can do, and and that's that's it, man. I don't I don't I don't <laughs> I don't have all the answers, but logically, you know, something is just like yo, like you you don't see that. Yeah. Go ahead, Red. You had a question? Yeah, I um, you guys kind of cut me off, so I kind of forget it. But it was, <laughs> <laughs> I had to do the long lines of like Coach Pal. Like when I hear Jerry speak, I know you guys had a great relationship. Um, you speak as if maybe he instilled some of those things in you because that's kind of what he was trying to do when he was leading McCaskey's team. Yeah, I mean, Coach Powell, man, was like, you know, it's like you, there's, there's tears in your life. You know what I'm saying? When I was coming up, that the boys club had Arnell. Arnell, I passed off, went to Coach Powell. And it's just like, Coach Powell was just like, a, you know, he was a great person, man, and and, and you know, People always talked about like coaching or this and this and that, but it was bigger than that. Like people don't understand. Like when I was talking to Seth Berger down at West Town, the founder of Anwan, uh, on my yeah. dad talked about coaching and how coaching high school basketball is not is not X and X and O's. You know what I'm saying? It is, but the gist of it and the high percentage of it, 80, 80, 90 percent of it, ninety percent of it, percent of it is of it is being your doctor, your mentor, and I think Coach Powell was the perfect person for what he did and what he meant for the city. Absolutely. Um, because he, you know, you're down where inner city kids and don't have moms, don't have parents, you know, this, drugs, this, not going to school, bad grades. It was so much bigger than basketball, you know what I mean? You know, even for me, like, he hired me in the summertime, you know, cutting long grass, never gave me anything and made me work for it. But that's the side that people don't see. You know what I mean? They always see the side of just whatever, how they felt about him personally or how he was as a coach. They didn't see the big picture. You know what I'm saying? And I still think even at McCaskey, man, like they, I don't think they did enough for what, they don't think they did enough in his remembrance um, 
for him being gone. Hey, he, he gave 40 years of his life. You know what I mean? And I think at least at, at minimum, that court should have his name on it. At Absolutely. Min- Absolutely. At minimum. You know what I'm saying? I think that, that I don't know who's in charge of that, but for sure, man, that should be, you know, Steve Powell or Gymnasium. You know what I mean? What is his name on it? He gave 40 years of his life. You know what I'm saying? And I think that Coach Powell was definitely that. You know what I mean? He was definitely, um, you know, I always had my father, my biological, always, my dad, amazing. Coach Powell was always an outsider. You know what I mean? He was always that guy for me. You know what I mean? He's, he's done so much. I mean, I, he's done so much for me, like things that I don't even want to talk about. You know what I'm saying? That I would never say publicly. You know what I mean? But and but not just me, for a lot of the guys at McCaskey. You know what I mean? I, and it's just sometimes I look at it and it's it's just sad to see, one, you know, the way he went out, but two, even more so, what people who have control of have given back on what he's done. I think it's terrible. No, it was always there. Was always there. I'm actually glad you said it, though, because I think a lot of people share that same sentiment, and it's just it is it is terrible. Go ahead, Mark. You have a question. So whoever's in charge, whoever's in charge, think Jimmy said. Whoever, uh, go ahead, Jerry. Whoever's in charge, or whoever has to do it. There has to be some kind of petition or something. They need to change that name on McCaskey. And Coach Powell name need to be on it. Go ahead. No, I agree with you 100%. And uh, just co- I always try to explain to people the difference between coaching in a city and the suburbs. And you got to be more than an X and an O guy to coach in the city. You could be the great X and O guy, but you're never going to be a great coach in a city if you don't realize you got to be a father figure. You got to be yeah. this for these guys, a role model. It's, it's about, more than that. It's about, it's about relationships. And if you can't, if you can't walk yourself in those kids' shoes and be able to talk to them or walk in their neighborhood or knock on their door and walk in their house and sit down, it's, it's, not, it's never going to work. It's not going to work. Yeah, like, like I coach a Steve in football, and they, you can tell, like, you see the difference. We get kids from, like, the country. We get kids from the suburbs. We get kids from the city. And, like, their requests are always different. So I may have a kid that came from the suburbs where his, his request is um, – something on film. We, can we watch more film, Coach? And he don't have the same worry as that kid that came from the city where I had a kid ask me, hey, Coach, is there any way you can do me a favor, I promise I'll pay you back. Can you give me some laundry detergent? Like the requests are so, it's just so different from, from where they come from. It's like you can help them, but you can help them only differently. And that, that kid, that his worry is so different. So he has school, he has football, but he also got to worry about, man, I can't even wash my clothes unless yeah. I help. Unless I help you. Look, man, I work, I'm at Lockadamia, man, and this kids, man, it's just, it's a whole different world, man. It's like, kids have so much pain, man, if you can't at least be a person they feel comfortable talking to or listening to, it's, that relationship's not gonna work. I don't care what, what you give or what you give, you gotta be able to and it's, it's, it's more of a transparency and a heart thing, heart to heart thing. If you don't have that feeling, you ever, you ever just talk to somebody where you can feel without them saying it. You can walk, be in a room with somebody, and yes. you can feel if that person is good for you or not. You don't have to say anything. You can just feel. Nah, they just got to trust you, and they know it. They just know. Exactly. Yep. Nah, but like, like we said, like we salute you for that, because you could be anywhere – in the world, literally, <laughs> coaching basketball, moving your family, and, and you know what I mean, go, go set up shop in a different country and, and uh, coach professional. You, you can be Division One coach somewhere. Like, but you chose, you know what I mean, to come here and, and, and make a difference. So, like, that's real. And uh, as a guy who, like, dedicated, dedicated his life to helping young people, like, we need, we need more of that, uh, just more successful people coming back that they can see and touch and know and, 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 and ask questions from. Uh, right, but on, on the flip side of that too, though, like I said, it has to be something that's allowing them to come back, you know what I mean? Yeah. Instead of having to break down the door, you know what I'm saying? But uh, it'll come. It'll come. Buddy Calhoun uh, commented saying, when Lancaster sports does well, Lancaster does well. Uh, I fully agree. Easy. 
you got to understand something, man. We come, we are an urban city, man. You know, we, we, we thrive off of sports. You know, sports is our life, you know what I mean? And when football is doing well, when basketball is doing well, the community is engaged. The whole city. Communities Yo. together. I mean, I remember when we had, I, I remember when we had half court shots, man. The gym was packed. Man, I remember when we were in that, we were in that Lancaster magazine. You know what I mean? It's that Lancaster Pride. You know what I mean? Yeah. Our I kids need that magazine. I have to hear. Yeah. You know, we, we need things that's going to keep us um, intrigued, you know, keep us challenged. You know what I'm saying? It's the way it is. You know what I mean? When you take those things away, they become a problem. You know what I mean? I almost feel like sometimes things are done for those things to be like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, systematic. Uh, Samar, you got a question? Yeah, I'll transition a little bit. Uh, you got – how many kids you got, Jerry? Uh, three. How old, are your, how old are your boys? <clears throat> JJ's 13. Um, Jasir is 11. And then I have a daughter. She's um she's sixteen. Yeah, I, I ref JJ, so I see him. He's a ball player. Are your kids really invested in basketball? Uh, I think my daughter is now. I think my daughter is. Um, what about the you know, kids? Boys? Yeah, they are. I mean, they are. They like to play, but it's still yet to. We'll see. You know, what I mean, I, I mean, you know, they have some. They understand the game. I mean, they've been around it. Um, and I will train them here and there. You know, not as much as I would like to, but. Um, you know, I try to, I want them to come to me. Like, my daughter comes to me and is like, Dad, let's do this, let's do that. You know what I mean? But my kids, they're, they're still engaged, but we'll see. We'll see, you know, the next year or so, how they, you know, how things are going to be. Well, so, uh, your daughter, uh, too, for like winning this title. Oh, go ahead, Samar. Well, just for being from this area, I mean, you're one of the best players that ever come from this area. And uh, do you feel that's going to put pressure on your on your sons or your daughters? As, as ball players, and how you, um, how you plan on having them handle that? I mean, I think it's going to be pressure anyway because of, because of what I've done, you know what I'm saying? Um, and people are automatically going to think that, oh, that's Jerry's kid, or oh, they must be able to play. They, they must have game. But I don't, put that, I don't put that strain on them as a dad. You know what I'm saying? I don't, I'm not forcing them to, um, to have to play, you know what I'm saying? I want them to, because I want to keep them engaged, but I'm not forcing them 100%, maybe like 65%. <laughs> and, <laughs> no, it's funny that you say about them because of your name, because just being in certain circles, I mean, I've heard coaches say things like, you know, Jerry's kids in the program and CV, they, they have some talent coming up, just because they're your kids. And you'll say, right. well, uh, well, my kids, they, they have the concept. I mean, they can play. I mean, they're, they're pretty good. But are they are they gonna do they wanna take it to that level? I don't know. Yeah. You know, I mean that's it's one of those things where I rather I rather the sense where um I know how hard it is. I know the sacrifices I made. And looking at them, do I think that they're ready to make those sacrifices? Are they ready to be in the gym every day, all day? You know what I'm saying? Mm. And a question I, I asked you, and I talked to B-Way about this, and my brother, we all have young boys who are trying to come up, and hopefully they play sports. Is um, I mean, obviously your kids are going to grow up differently than you grew up. My kids growing up differently than I grew up, and my brother grew up. How do you still put that worth ethic into them or when they don't have to worry about the things you worried about or I worried about growing up? Well, it's one of those things where they watch me. They watch me. Like, my kids watch me train. They watch me play. So they, I think they see and know what it takes. But are they willing to, are they willing to do that? You know what yeah, I'm saying? You know how, like, you felt basketball was your way out. It was your way to get an education, your way to make your life better. How, like, is your kid going to be able to feel that same way you felt when they're not growing up with that kind of need as much? Well, I could say it's, it's tough because they, they, they don't have – they have what I didn't have. Yeah. They, they're growing up in two totally different demographics. 
They're growing up in different times. We're different people around them. You know what I'm saying? I walk to school. You know what I mean? I, my daughter goes to, goes to Catholic. Goes to goes to Catholic. I never had to pay to pay to go to school. Yeah. I walk from South End to McCaskey every day in the cold. You know what I mean? My kids here, they take a bus. Sometimes they don't even want to get up and, and, and walk to the bus stop. Uh, no. 30-second walk. Oh, it's cold out. Can you, can you drive me? To... So it's different. Yeah, that's what you I'm know? asking you. What do you think, in your opinion, how do you overcome that? Because you really can't recreate that. It's hard, for your... Yeah, it's hard, man. It's just kind of just talking to them. I try to tell them, look, man, you guys are growing up different than me. And this is one of those things that I can tell them. But they have to kind of catch on themselves. You know what I mean? I think it's just a fine line of hoping that they can do it without me, what, hoping that they understand and me telling them at the same time. Yeah, yeah I, I don't think there's anything you could, uh, like yeah. you could really do because there's, like- There's no potion, there's no, there's, no, there's no food I can make and give and feed them and say, oh, I understand. You know what I mean? It's just, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. just hoping that they see all the different things that's going on, me talking to them, you know, being respectful, not being ungrateful, hoping that all that stuff ponders to them and hopes they're able to put that into their life. You know what I'm saying? No, nah, I was just curious your opinion because I feel like it's a challenge for me because there's things I went through that I felt like, you know, going through them, you, they made me who I was today. They put certain things in me that made me who I am today. And I can't recreate that for my son. And uh, so I'll just see how you, how you look at it. There's like, there's no real answer. It's just you're telling them, hoping that they it happens. There's, there's nothing you can really do. Yeah, like, well, shout so, out to you. You know, it's like one of the things where it's like, you know, you can be at a family cookout, and then your uncle can be like, or your relative can be like, to your dad, they'd be like, look, man, he turned out pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> he turned out that way. You know what I mean? It's just like, it's kind of like a crapshoot, like hoping – we give him everything he needs to be successful and he learns on his own and understands. There's, there's nothing you can do. Yeah. Well, Samar was, what, Samar was being disrespectful with uh, asking about your boys. But shout out to your daughter for winning the, uh, a district championship last year with Catholic. Uh, girl, girls play basketball too, you know, Samar? I, I, never, I didn't never ref his daughter. I don't know. I, knew, I ref JJ. I knew he had another boy because I see him at the game. I, I just didn't know. It wasn't uh, a disrespect. It was a Lack of knowledge. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know how old she was. I didn't know she was that old. We have a comment from uh, Tony Miller. I know. I know you know him. He, he uh, Jerry. He's gave you the gym a bunch of times. That's Stevens. Tony. Oh yeah. Tony's, oh, Tony's amazing. He definitely yeah, has. Yeah, yeah. So he says. Uh, I and guess I he, we can, he was uh, referencing. He was referencing. I think your kids. The question my brother asked, and he was just saying, has to come from inside, no matter what, and who the yeah. parents are. I met three of you, which he's talking about us three, besides Samar. Um, I met three of you, and you're really good dads. If your children's passion is not sports, they will have passion and something positive. Continue to grow, be humble, and have some respect. Oh yeah, definitely, it definitely comes from upbringing. Yeah, hundred percent right, definitely upbringing. I know Tony; he's made sure you got that gym a few times. Oh, uh, Tony, definitely, Tony, definitely uh, has taken care of. Um, us and, and Lakadema and me and even times where I was uh, still playing in Europe, you know, allowing me to train and, uh, you know, use, use that gym too. Um, but, you know, that gym is it's a nice facility too, but, you know, there's a lot of different people that use it, but hopefully with Lakadema we can continue to build a relationship um, for that gym also. Thank you, Tony. I appreciate you, man. Uh, go ahead, Samar. You look like you're about to say something. No, I was just going with a basketball question. Um, a lot of kids coming up in the, just in the area in general, they're talented. Even that kid, the CD Crash, just committed to one of the top JUCO schools in the country. What do you feel, like, if you had to give advice to some of these players that don't know you, didn't see you play, but know you play cross seas professionally, what was one tip you would give them? Like, what does it take? What do you have to sacrifice to make it over there and play across seas? I just think one, you just have to be in positions that find people who want to help you. Um, just work hard. You know, 
don't don't take don't make excuses um just be open to you know to different ideas and different people um i think one thing too i learned too is that you can't do it yourself you're always going to need somebody no matter what level of success you're you're on whether it's higher level and it's it's a grind man and you just have to reach out to people that who who who've done it you know what i mean whether you know them or not find them talk to people get in people's ears you know what i'm saying i think that that's not just for sports that's business too what Everything. was the biggest challenge for you going over if you put yourself back in your shoes when you first went over cross seas what was the biggest challenge to adjust to playing somewhere where you don't speak the language there's nobody looks like you around like how do you do that i think again it's just what, what are your goals what you want because depending on what you want and why the challenge is just being being better and being as best as you can be um and you know besides the the the, the language barriers and living away that was probably the, the biggest challenge but I just think working hard and, and having the will to not fail is a challenge also to not not want to fail that's that's How the biggest challenge the language cuz like now we have apps they mean Brandon in Brazil last year and we used you know Google Translate a lot but you didn't have that back when you first went across seas how did you communicate how did you talk to teammates um i think in basketball pretty much everybody speaks language you know i mean speaks english you know i mean speaks english um but you'll find now man like even then english is an international language man and, and a lot more people are speaking the language and it's not too many places where you can't go these days and can't find somebody that speaks english and plus you know when you're playing basketball you don't need to speak anything yeah that's what speaks for itself you know what i mean i mean you do need to talk but i'm just saying in the sense of things you know basketball is 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 a language of its own yeah be we are an hour and 20 minutes in i mean we could go all day yeah man let's let, let's let uh let's let jerry get out of here anybody else got anything important they want to they want to get to you ain't got no more questions? I still, got we, I still have some, but how long we go, man? <laughs> yeah. I mean, let's well, go. People are curious, though, I would say about, I know in 2005, after you graduated Ryder, you, you played on the Clippers Summer League team. Was the NBA yeah. ever, how did you feel about the NBA in general? Was that a goal of yours, or are you okay just going where you went? Well, I had a, well, I had, I had a couple workouts with the, um, with the Nets, and I thought they would call me. Um, at least uh, for like a like a free agent type thing, but they didn't. Um, and then like I had a had an NBA agent too. I had a guy named Keith Glass who was his dad name was Joe Glass who was a big NBA agent at that time. And um, I think once once because I had some workouts once NBA summer league was there and this was what I was thinking where like I didn't have any other opportunities and I think my agent kind of got. Without saying that, you know, you can read between the lines. I think he didn't really have a position for me because he didn't really know what. And I was getting eager too because I was like, man, I gotta, I need something. Man, I got a kid, man. I, you know, I know I'm gonna play. I know I'm gonna make some money, but I don't know where. So then I, I rerouted. I, I got rid of him and got another agent that was a little bit lower, and he sent me to Poland. You know what I mean? So I never really uh, tried to go back. Like a lot of players, they. They play for a while. They play, play with it. They go back and forth trying to, you know, play in summer league, trying to do that. I tried it one time and then work kind of stayed in Europe. I just made a career out of Europe right away. How did you feel you did in the summer league? I don't remember. I don't remember why. I, I, I was just on a roster. I didn't. I didn't get a chance to play. I mean, there was, you had um, Sean Livingston at the time. He just came in the league. He was coming out of high school, and then you had um, Mario Chalmers who played with Xavier at that time when they they made that Final Four. I think they made that like that tournament run. And then they draft. No, yeah, Mario played for, for Trump, Kansas. Trump played, uh, Kansas. He had the game winning shot against uh, Memphis. I think it was, yeah. Um, they had like Roman Sato and those guys. And then um, they drafted Dan Ewing from Duke. So I was like the fourth point guard. So there was really no play. He was drafted, so I was just brought in. So there was really no space for me to even play. 
You know what I mean? So I was like, you know, reroute. You know what I mean? What's next? <laughs> yeah. What was your favorite city in, uh, that you played in? Out of all the, like, Turkey, Poland, France, Greece? Oh, uh, oh man, Istanbul, man. Turkey. Shout out to Turkey, man. Istanbul. <laughs> I love Turkey, cool, man. I love Turkish people. Istanbul is like a New York City. I loved it, man. Istanbul is my all-time favorite um, city as today that I've been to. Jeez. People, fans, um, the culture, the people. It was, I loved it, man. It was good. I, I, I liked it. I liked it a lot. You always hear the stories about playing across seas where people throwing batteries and the fans are crazy. Do you deal with any of that? I'll give you stories in like Lan- Lancaster and United States where people are throwing batteries. In the <laughs> 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 you know, there's crazy stuff all over different places. You know what I mean? It's just what you're focusing on. Yeah. yeah. We had uh we had Dustin on a while ago. And, uh, he, he, he Man, that was a long time ago. That was like one of our first shows. Like, it was like, t- it was like 10 shows in or something. Yeah, we got to get Dustin back, man. But, uh, he was giving us just like these horror stories about, you know, people's paychecks might not come in sometimes and like stuff like that. You never had to deal with any, any anything like that where, uh, I mean, I mean, per, me personally, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been in Sicily where I got paid late. Um, but, um, I always, you know, one, I always played well and, you know, it happens. I'm not going to say it doesn't happen. It happens to a lot of people. I, I know, late payments, um, getting fined. But I was, you know, I had a great agent. I probably had a number of the best agent in Europe. So I always had good representation. Um, and I always had, so that put me always on the best, the best teams, the best situations, the best organizations. So, you know, I mean, there's, there's, but there is that side too, like Dustin said, there is that side where you're not getting paid, not doing this, not doing that. But I was fortunate enough to always be able to play well and to have some luck too. But consistency and 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 having good representation is key. You know what I mean? And I and I really haven't had that issue that that much. You know what I mean? Not to the point to where I was like pissed off or mad. I'm, of course I would be I was mad, but that helped me not go through those things. Gotcha. All right, man. Let's let them get out of here, man. Y'all good? Nah, man. Tell us what's in that trophy case. <laughs> <laughs> what's in that trophy case? <laughs> A couple thousand point balls, two thousand point balls, college stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> A little small stunt on them. Something, right something light. Something light. I'll it leave it one my- last question though about his new career. So there's always this stigma around great players having trouble being good coaches. And uh, I mean, you're a great player in this area and you're coaching in this area now. Has it been a challenge for you or do you feel like it's natural transition? I mean, it's, I mean, it's not easy. I mean, I don't, I don't know if I'm a good coach or a bad coach. I look at myself as a pillar of success and putting these, the kids in the right position they need to be in um, and having fun with it. You know what I mean? I'm not looking to be the next Coach K. I'm not looking to be uh, the next coach that's, that has 500 wins. I ain't worried about that. All I want to do is make sure the kids that I see and I know that want to be a part of Lockadamia have a clean shot and a share of using their abilities and having the right connections around them to have a chance to uh, take their games to the next level and, and most importantly, get it, use it to get an education. Because, you know, it's, it costs a lot of money to go to school. You know what I mean? You're talking 200000 you know, or whatever it may be. Whatever it is, you can go to JUCO. You can go to, you can go to a two-year school or whatever it may be. But we all know that, that education is expensive. And I'm all for a kid that has an ability and, you know, just so happens it's basketball. That as long as I'm there at La Academia, I'm going to put the kids in the best position to succeed. And that's, that's why I'm there. I'm there to help kids and, see, and they see me there. And they know what time it is. You know what I mean? You know, within within reason. You know what I mean? I'm not I'm not running around trying to 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 knock on kids' doors and say you need to come play for me. You need to not. I'm not about that. I don't, I don't do that with my youth program that I have, and I won't do that in the in the profession that I'm in now. If you see I'm there, 
and you want to be a part of academia and you want to come, welcome. You know what I mean? I'm not here to, to sell anything to anybody. And it's not a guarantee that the kids will be, but just know that you're there like them. I'm going to put you in the right position. Hmm. How are you in the Oh, I got one more question. I got one more question about uh, um, back to basic. What's going on with your with your foundation? And your, oh, your summer league? I forgot, to, oh, forgot to, to shout out to Tommy, principal there. You know, Tommy Henley. Tommy Henley trying to do a good job from Chicago. Um, you know, he's giving me an opportunity to to be uh, a person of voice and, and a person of making sound decision and, and helping the community. And I think that him giving me that opportunity um, and not being from Lancaster and just based off what I've done, giving me the, the, the torch and letting me run with it. You know, you can't be in, in a better position than that, you know, for what I'm doing. So I think I thank Tommy for that. And I, I really appreciate it for that. So with the question again, my bad. Uh, back to basics. What's going on with back to basics? I don't know, man. We're just waiting. I mean, it's tricky right now, man. You know, it's it's hard to it's hard to say um, what's going on with it. I mean, I know once you know the gyms are able to open back up, I don't know, you know, what what we'll do what we can do, and kind of go from there. You know, what we can't do, we'll try to make up with some trainings and things like that, youth development, but. You know, it's kind of like day to day. So <laughs> I'll tell a story real quick about the first time I met Jerry. So, I mean, I'm sure you don't remember. It was the first day of uh, basketball. Yeah, for him, and uh, you were, we were playing, we were just running games after workouts. And uh, Mike, I forget his last name. He was, uh, he was Polish, Polish Mike, remember him? He had a brother right. named Pete. I do. I remember those guys. They used to play on Lemon Street all the time. Yeah, he used to play at the park. James Street Park. Uh, Mike came down and gave a little crossover. Everybody was like, ooh, you were guarding them. And the very next, you got the rebound off the make, and you came down. You came cross, and then behind your back, and Mike slid back on his ass. And <laughs> I was like, oh, shit, like, this dude really is the real deal. It was the very next play you did it to him. So I just, I just know how competitive you are. And now that your career, you're retired, I like, where do you, how do you fill that void? Like, cause competitive people oh. like to compete, even when they're done playing, it's just something in them. Well, I mean, as much as I love basketball and, you know, playing in Europe for so long and being around it, it became a business. You know what I mean? It became a business. And sometimes when things become a business, it kind of takes its life and takes out of things. So as much as I love basketball, I, I, I show my, my love through it by trying to help others, but I don't really, I don't miss playing. Because I play, I played, I played for a living, and, and I played for a reason. So now, that reason's gone. You know what I mean? So it's it's not the same for me. And even when I was was playing, like recreational wise, it's not the, it's it's different, man. Because I played for I played for a reason to win, and the reason why I don't play rec wise anymore much is because. I can't hold other guys accountable. Accountable for me like I'm playing in Europe or I'm playing on that level, you know what I'm saying? So I just more enjoy of, 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 of teaching and, you know, watching young kids play. Um, but I don't know, maybe every now and then I might, once things open up, I might play. But I kind of lost that part of it because of the business side of it. Okay, that's a good answer. I, never, I didn't think about that point. I can't, obviously I can't relate, so I just thought, Losing that as part of your life, that would have been tough for you. Nah, so I don't really, I don't, no, nah, so really, I don't miss playing. Actually, I don't miss, I don't miss playing. I mean, even if it's, but you know what, though, there is times where, like, I see pictures, like, there was a picture that was in my news feed yesterday morning when I woke up with me, like, at a championship, flying by, like, I get, like, seconds of, like, dang, yo, I miss it. Like, even when I went down and watched Ryder play Temple, um, I get little phases, but it's just, like, a, a quick little twitch, and then it's like, ah. <laughs> no, that's funny that that uh you say that. I can't relate that way, but like I remember talking to Samar a while ago, and like after football was over for me, I stopped lifting, I stopped working out. And he was like, "Well, why you stop going to the gym?" And I'm like, "Well, I'm not training for nothing no more. So like yeah. it's, it's, the the purpose is gone. Like I'm not yeah. trying to get bigger, stronger, faster. 
I'm not trying to be one of those regular guys at the gym. I just going to the gym for no. I, I didn't understand it. <laughs> he told me that. He told me that. But even when I even when I go jogging, like I, I jogged the other day around my neighborhood, and normally when I was playing, I'd push through and and do two more laps or run ten more minutes or fifteen more minutes. And I got tired. And I was like, I'm done now. I'm going home and eat me some printer subjects. <laughs> <laughs> nah, B Way told me I was doing suicides one time at the gym for cardio. He was like, Man, I'm never sprinting the rest of my life. That's a dog, <laughs> that's a dog's chasing me or something. <laughs> I, mean, I, 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 still, I still try to get a sweat here and there when I can. Um, but right now, this is not where I'm at in my life. Um, even though I, you know, staying in shape is still what kept me healthy and kept me in shape. Um, but I've been lucky genetic wise too, though. So, right, but man, we salute you, man. Uh, like I said, you always have a platform here with us. Uh, hey, if, if anybody watching, oh, basketball right now, culture, man. Yeah, I'm about, I was about to say, if anybody uh, okay. watching right now on uh, on Thursdays, Jerry does uh, basketball culture talks with different. Uh, guys in the basketball realm or the athletic realm and i mean you're, you're missing out on some good information uh that lamar patterson interview by the way was a classic man yeah i mean he had lamar on he had uh seth berg on last week which was i thought that was another classic yeah yeah those back-to-back -back classics you got both those on youtube man Every, all of us ain't on facebook i'm trying to get them and post them on youtube man <laughs> i'm saving them yeah i'm posting <laughs> Okay, I, I wouldn't mind watching some. I just I'm not oh, them two, the, them two oh. back to back though. That's that that Lamar and that oh, and that Steph man. one. They're... I'm like, dang, I had, I had two going down. But I got I got my um a good friend of mine I played with in France. His name is Tony Skin. Um, he's an assistant coach at Seton Hall, and um he, he's going to be up next on Thursday. And he um they were top ten. They were like number seven, um top twenty five. You know, college teams, um, men's basketball. This past year, man. So that you know, they were a ranked team. So it, it'll be good to have them have him on next. You know, just talk about you know his his journey and coaching and playing the Nigerian national team, playing against the Olympic teams. So that's gonna be dope. Now, uh, dope. Seton Hall was crushed, man, when they canceled the tournament. They were trying to make and be yeah. a good season this year. They yeah, did, man. It was, it was cool because I, I I was able to get up there and, to a practice and watch them practice too when they were like top, when they were like number twelve, I think. But yeah, he'll be on Thursday, so that'll be a, a, a dope one too. A classic Seth Berger story was like that I didn't know and I got from watching the thing was uh about how the 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 classic Vince Carter dunk contest he was was this, Seth Berger is the the guy who started M1 founder of M1 the founder and owner of M1 yeah so that classic uh Vince Carter dunk contest that uh, that we all know of uh he was wearing M1 sneakers and it was because uh, he was in a contract debate with uh, Nike and Adidas, so he didn't want to wear any of theirs. He was like, "Well, just give me those." <laughs> and he went out there and some had one sneakers and 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 you know, what I mean, one put on the best dunk contest ever. So, like, just stuff like that. You, like, you, this is classic stuff that you guys are getting on this uh, basketball culture talks. Yeah, it's, it's 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 crazy. It's good, man. But you know, it's even. Um, uh, Amazing just to be able just to be to have something like that and be able to reach out to those people all because I've played basketball and played at a high level and having those connections and relations with people is huge. You know what I mean? To get up and like Seth texted me yesterday. You know what I mean? It's just kind of like you know you got a, you got you got a, the CEO and founder of and one who his friends are the owners of the Sixers and the Flyers <laughs> that you be able to, to text with. You know what I mean? It's just and you know, Speedy Claxton up in New York and, and Lamar Patterson is just it's just amazing to have friends like that. You know, shout out to Gene Gene Lambert. Um, he's been amazing too. He's down the rare. Um, he's been in my corner through the whole transitioning of, of being an A D coach. He's a good coach. Um, Gene, good dude, man. He's and Gene too, you know, having having those type of people in your phone means a lot. You know, what I mean, you know, my 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 phone, my my kids, my kids get on me about my phone, because it's not like, it's not the latest. I find it's like a seven, but they all got 11s or whatever. But this phone right here is worth more than theirs. You know what I'm saying? 
yep. of the contacts of people I have in this phone. <laughs> 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 so it's just amazing to be in a situation like that, man. And it's good. Good situation. Well, definitely, man. You're putting uh, Lancaster on the map. Uh, I mean, we salute you just, just, just for being back here and, and being able to touch uh, the community the way you are. So we salute you for that. And you're always welcome here on Opinionated Facts or anything TCP related. I mean, I mean, you're part of the family. So let us be the voice whenever you need to, to get something out or whatever. And we, we, we're going to support you. Thank you, man. I appreciate it, man. Samara, Brandon, um, other Brandon. <laughs> That's B-Y. Who's the, who's the other Brandon? B-Y? It's got to be B-Y. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> I'm, I'm the, other one, the other one, the other one. <laughs> nah, I appreciate y'all, man. I appreciate y'all, and 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 what y'all are doing is, you know, giving people a voice. And I think hearing from people and listening, I think you guys are doing a great job. And I appreciate you all. And uh, you know, you guys are also important people in our in our community. And, um, you know, like they say, it takes a village, and it takes more than one person to to get that voice out and to help people. And and I thank you guys for what you are for what you are doing too. Definitely, man. I yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. Giving us two. Well, we're probably going two hours now. Yeah, yeah man. Let's get shout outs in. Just get your shout outs in, Red, uh, Samara. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, forgot, hold on. I forgot too, man. Shout out to you, Samara, too, man. Um, you know, being a fighter fighter in the community and all this stuff going on, man. And, you know, I, your job's important, man. And we 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 thank you for, for for what you do too, and you know putting yourself in the line to save thank lives. You, appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. Red shout outs. Shout outs. Uh, shout out to the movement and everyone that's you know trying to make a difference and open up their eyes and see what's going on in our country right now. Um, I think a lot of a lot of the things have been positive, though you see a lot of negative things on, on the news. Um, there are some good things going on in the country right now, especially for for uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and, and it's, I mean, it's a host of other things. And I think a lot of times we don't even touch on it like we should probably on certain episodes. I know we did a whole episode on it last week, but I mean, it'd be nice to get some people on here to talk more about their experiences with police brutality or, or racism as a whole. Uh, shout out to the NFL for finally jumping on the bus, even though they're a couple of years late. Even though they're a couple of years late, look, beggars can't be choosers, man. We they are late, nah. but We're shouting NFL out on here, man. No, well, I'm shouting them out. I did it. <laughs> I did it already. Just shouting them out because maybe they 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 admitted they were wrong. So can't be mad at that. Like, we can't get mad at every time someone makes a mistake. We got to be completely upset and say, no, we're not accepting that. Sometimes you got to accept, sometimes you got to accept the apology. I mean, I, Cap, I know. Does Cap get his job back, though? Does Cap get a job? I don't think Cap gets a job, period. I, think, no, I don't see? think it ever happened. Well, then I'm not That's not the reason why I'm, why I'm saying what I'm saying. Cap back. That's not why I'm saying. We did, <laughs> look, I'm not getting into that argument again. Yeah, but that's I the first thing you think about, though. If, if, you, can, if you can apologize to that, why can't you public publicly say, Kaepernick, we apologize? They exactly, can't do that. Jerry. Until they do that. They're not going to do, do that. They do that. If they do that, that's admitting that they blackballed them. Yeah. Well, they, they already paid them. So oh, they already paid, he already won the one. They already he already won the lawsuit. So they settled with him, so they did admit apology it. Apology right? costs you nothing. Apology costs you nothing. So so, so with the apology, uh, also like a a direct subliminal sorry and apologize to Kaepernick too. I don't know. I don't know what was in Roger Goodell's heart. I just <laughs> <laughs> nah. I don't know. I don't know if that was meant for Cap or what. I'm just saying the fact that they got him on board. We've been asking for them to 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 openly admit some some things and. And 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 stand with Black Lives Matter movement, and they finally oh. done. It. Yes, I agree. They're late. Or did JD send him a text message like, "Yo, you gotta apologize, yo." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know what he did. I don't know, man. I said they're late. I saw like get, they are late, but I'm cool with the apology. Not necessarily. I ain't saying that that's where they got to stop. I feel like they still have to do more, especially being the kind of industry that they are. They still have to do more. But that's a start. 
We want people to open their eyes. That's what we want. Right. That's true. Don't don't act like nothing's going on. Don't act like this didn't happen or this didn't happen. And we're not saying our lives matter more than anybody else's, but they matter. That's all we're saying. And anyone who's with that, I'm I'm cool with. Tomorrow, you got any shout outs? I'm going to shout out Lancaster because the only thing I was worried about is I didn't want anybody taken away from the meaning of the protest. And Lancaster came out and protested peacefully. We didn't destroy our own city. And we're on day 12 or 13 now. And Philadelphia had the largest crowd they had since the um, Super Bowl parade. New York had a peaceful protest last night. D.C. had a peaceful protest last night. And that's 13 days in and 90 degree heat, man. So shout out to everybody out there walking for a cause that's meaningful to everybody on this platform, everybody, and my kids and your kids as well. Yo, how about the, the how, what y'all think about the Black the Black Lives Matter imprint? Woo! That was, was in DC. Shout out to the mayor. <laughs> shout out to the mayor for that, man. I mean, that's, that's, I, I love as it. a black person, I'm not even sure I would have ordered that. You're going to put up fences around the White House, you can't even get within a, a meter of it. That You can't get close to the White House. They put cages up. Then, yeah, I like what the mayor did. Yeah, I like what she did. I don't, but I'm, I'm, I started thinking, would I have done the same thing? I don't even know, honestly. I couldn't, I, I know I can't answer that question. Like, would I have? But so shout out to her for making that, that decision. Yeah, uh, she should go down in, in, in like African American history, man. That stuff, <laughs> that thing right there is special. Like that was that was dope. Uh, Jerry, saying that Black Lives Matter. We didn't say only Black Lives Matter. We're saying Black Lives Matter too. Don't make it about you when it's not about you, man. I can't stand yeah. that. It's like you know, what I mean, uh, you going to report to a fire, and you got to put out that fire. You're not saying that that house, like all houses, matter. You're just saying one house is on fire. Yeah, you're just saying. One house is standing right now. This one's burning down. That's the one I'm going to focus on. All right. <laughs> exactly. Jerry, you got any shout outs? You got me, Jerry? I don't know. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what's God doing? <laughs> I was thinking, man. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I want to shout out, uh, shout out Keanu Bowman, Max Arbor Place. Shout out to uh, 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 Tony Miller, Thaddeus Stevens, uh, Principal Tommy Henley. You know, everyone who, you guys, everyone who's supporting and, and just trying to uplift people. Uh, even people who, who start to understand what's going on. People who, who are being receptive. Um, you know, even people who are thinking one way or now thinking another way because they see what's going on and it might not be totally their fault. Uh, and just shout out to people who are just trying to do better and see people do well and, uh, you know, bringing, bringing the world and cities together uh, to one. And, uh, you know, shout out to everybody, man, and everybody who's trying to do well. And that's pretty much it, man. That's pretty much it. Definitely. Uh, shout out to all the protesters out there that are definitely uh, doing it. Shout out to all the, the non-African-American uh, protesters out there as well, because, you know what I mean, we can't do this thing without you. And you guys took the movement to a whole other level. Uh, shout out to uh, the Seven Letter family, as always. And, I mean, shout out to Jerry for coming through. Definitely appreciate it. Uh, we good, fellas? We, we, good to, we good to get up out of here? Yeah. Yes, sir. All right, man, make sure you guys stay laid up, stay prayed up, stay out the way, and listen to what some old folks have to say. See you guys next week. Peace.